Greetings. Uh, this will probably be a beginning to a multi-part study. Uh, by multi-part, maybe three or four parts, or maybe maybe just two. Uh, but in general, I want to ask a question. And it's been an age-old question that was answered a long time ago. Uh, but still to this day, sometimes the question still arises and still comes up. And we want to be able to answer it properly, uh, accurately, and truthfully. And see what the Bible says about the matter. So the question is, if there are no longer any Ten Commandments, should we go ahead and sin? The answer to that question is an easy no. So with that being said, if the, if the Ten Commandments are no longer in effect, if the Ten Commandments do not apply to the church, but just apply to Israel, then what do we Christians do today? What do believers do, those who want to follow Christ? The Bible is a big book, 66 books total. Which part applies to us? What can we, where does the Christian find their commandments? Where does the Christian find their instructions? Now, truthfully, the Bible is like the Bible says, that all of it is God inspiring, God breath. All of it is useful for, for teaching, rebuking, for admonishing in spirit. True. Uh, but specifically for the Christian, where does the Christian today, where does the believer today, the follower of Christ today, find their commands? So, the Bible is broken up in different covenants. A covenant simply is a binding agreement, a binding agreement. So you can make covenants with people, but in the Bible, we see covenants where God made covenants with man. Uh, we have many different covenants and covenants last for different times periods. Some covenants are conditional where they rely on a certain condition. And some covenants are unconditional where when God says he's going to do something, regardless of what man does, he will still keep his promise. So briefly, we're going to look at specifically two major covenants that God made with man. He made the what's known as the old covenant. In the Old Testament, you find the Mosaic law, also known as the Ten Commandment covenant, also known as the Sinai covenant. It's the law of Moses. That's the old covenant. And also what the Bible calls as the new covenant found in the New Testament also known as the law of Christ, also known as what James in the book of James calls the law of liberty. Also, I believe in the book of Hebrews, what it calls as grace and truth. So we got two different covenants. So we have two different agreements that God made with man. And we have to decipher, uh, not decipher, we have to rightfully understand and discern which one applies to who, which one applies to the church today. So very briefly, Again, you have multiple covenants in the Bible, and I'm going to be going backwards and forth here. Uh, you have multiple covenants in the Bible. And again, specifically for today, we're going to just focus on the one that was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, as well as grace and truth, which came through Jesus Christ. Um, just specifically, so what a covenant is. A covenant is made up of a promise, a condition, and a sign. So God makes a promise, then there are conditions to that promise. And then there is a sign in which maybe God will give or there is a sign in which God will command from man to perform, showing that they hold fast to that promise. So specifically, again, different covenants in the Bible, we have to be able to discern which one applies to us. Uh, so in the old law, in the Mosaic law, the law of Moses, the Ten Commandments covenant, that law was given specifically to the children of Israel. God gave his law to the Israelites. And prior to the law given to Moses, the covenant given to Moses that was given to specifically just to the nation of Israel, God made a covenant with Abram. At that time, he was known as Abram. And when God made his covenant with Abram, he told Abram, you're no longer Abram. You're going to start going by the name of Abraham. But God made a covenant with Abraham that he would be the father of multitudes, that he would be a father of many people and that his offspring would be more than he could ever number but that he would be a spiritual father to those after him. That uh, by Abraham's faith, he believed in what God said, and God said he considered him to be righteous. So by faith and by belief, that made Abraham righteous before God. So belief is where it all started. Hope, faith is where it all started. It all started with Abraham. That was what God promised Abraham is that, hey, through you, Many people basically will be saved. You're going to be the father of many spiritual people. You're going to be the father spiritually of a promise that I'm going to give that's going to affect many people. And this particular covenant is what we would like to look at and say is, is everlasting. Is everlasting. 
So they believe, and then we look into uh, all this can be found in the book of Genesis. So the promise that God made to Abraham can be found in the book of Genesis chapter 15, verses 1 through 5. But also look in Genesis 15 through 17, those entire chapters, those three chapters. But also you can look at Genesis 15, 6, where the condition is given. The Bible says that Abraham believed and God counted it as righteousness. And the sign in Genesis 17, 10 through 13 was circumcision. They don't that every male that was born, every boy that was born on the eighth day would be circumcised of the flesh. And this was a sign of the covenant and promise that God had made for Abraham and for his people. So furthermore, the Bible also says in Genesis 17 that, hey, in about 400 odd years, uh, something else is going to come into play. And about 430 years later, Moses came into play. God spoke through Moses. God used Moses. He called Moses and God made another commandment. Uh, he made another covenant. I'm sorry. I apologize. He made another covenant and he made a covenant with Moses. But before we jump to Moses, we're going to look at Genesis 17. And in Genesis 17, verse nine, uh, where matter of fact, we'll start at verse, verse four. Uh, it says, behold, my covenant is with you. And you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make you into nations and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession. And I will be their God. Verse nine. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their nations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. And it goes on to tell more in the following verses about the conditions of those circumcisions. But I just want to give you quickly and show you that God made a covenant with Abraham. And the covenant was that, hey, through you, I'm going to bless you, your offspring and generations after you. I'm going to give you all the land of Canaan. I'm going to give you a land of your own to have an everlasting promise. Does this sound familiar? Because this is going to point to the the law of Moses. He's going to point to the covenant that God gave to Moses for the children of Israel. Well, God gave Moses a promise that he would give them their own land, what's known as the promised land, the land of Canaan, a land to call their own. This all derived from the promise that God gave to Abraham. So through that promise, he gave a promise also to Moses. He gave a covenant also to Moses. But the covenant to Moses is totally different from the, the covenant given to uh, Abraham. As you see, uh, we'll jump on to Exodus chapter 2, uh, when it speaks about the promised land and the promise that was given uh, to Moses. So God made a promise to Moses. He spoke to Moses. He, uh, he spoke directly to Moses and used Moses as being uh, sort of like the, a prophet. Uh, used Moses as being... Uh, basically the speaker and the leader of the people. And he uh, gave his instruction to Moses and Moses gave that instruction to the children of Israel. But God made a promise to them, but there was a certain condition to the promises that was made. And the condition can be found in Exodus 19, seven through eight. For the lack of time, I won't read every single verse, but I'll be sure to display them uh, on the screen and potentially in the description below. But the condition was obedience. So God gave the Ten Commandment Covenant, he wrote, uh, Moses wrote those on the tablets of stone. And he gave uh, these Ten Commandment Covenants. And the condition for that covenant was obedience. Obedience had to be kept. And God said, hey, I'm going to get, there's going to be a sign of showing that this condition and this agreement is going to be instituted. He gave Israel the Sabbath, the what was known as the Sabbath. I believe the Sabbath is in Hebrew, in Hebrew, if I'm not mistaken, it means seventh. So it was just the seventh day. And at that point in time, 
Uh, the Sabbath was supposed to be a, a memorial. It was a remembrance. It was a, a time where God called the people to remember what I have done for you. What God had done for them was that he delivered them out of slavery, out of bondage. He took them out of a land that was foreign to them and gave them their own land in the land of Canaan. He fed them with milk and honey. He allowed uh, bread and manna to, to rain down from heaven to feed them. God took these people out of bondage and provided for them. And he made a covenant with Moses and made a covenant with these people in, in that time span. So God said, hey, I'll take care of you. I will be your God and you will be my people. But the condition is you must obey what it is I'm telling you to do. You must obey my commandments. And you're going to remember what I've done for you every Sabbath day. And there were many different conditions of what had to be done on the Sabbath day. Uh, there were so many requirements, uh, so many restraints and conditions uh, that had to be uh, respected and it and uh admired on that particular time period as we said before of course moses wrote a list of regulations that were supposed to be observed that got given to him but on that second pair of stones because moses had destroyed the first one god wrote with his finger on that second slab of stones on the ten commandment covenant so the covenant for israel and the covenant given to moses for israel was the ten commandment covenant it was the the mosaic law also known as the law of moses in Exodus 34, 28, it says that, and he wrote on the tablets the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments, Deuteronomy 4, 13. And he declared to you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform. That is the Ten Commandments. And he wrote them on two tablets of stone. Some additional verses can also be Deuteronomy 9, 9 through 12, verse 15, as well as Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 4. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verses 2 through 22, and 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 9, and verse 21. So, the law of Moses, the Mosaic law, started off the, as that Ten Commandment covenant. But God had also given additional regulations that were supposed to be um, observed and supposed to be obeyed. And altogether, total was 613 laws, 613 laws, 613 regulations, 613 things all compiled in this altogether law. So the Ten Commandment law was never given before Sinai, before Mount Sinai. That was the mountain that Moses was on when God gave law, gave Moses the law. So we saw the separation between the covenant given to Abraham and the covenant given to Moses. So what's going to happen into the future is that God is going to also give another covenant, going to give the better covenant. And the Bible calls it the better covenant. He's going to give grace and truth through Jesus Christ, also known as the gospel. So the gospel, grace and truth, the law of liberty, all are the same. The new covenant, the New Testament covenant, they all are the same. So it, you even prophesied, God prophesied about it through his prophet Jeremiah. And spoke about it in Jeremiah 31, verses 31 and 32, where God talking to Jeremiah, he said that I will make a new covenant. Now, this is why the Mosaic law is already into effect. He says, I will make a new covenant, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers when I took them out of Egypt. So God took the Israelites out of Egypt and he gave them the law of Moses. But God told Jeremiah, his prophet, that I'm going to give the new prophet, not like the one I gave to you all's fathers. I'm going to give another one in the future. And it's going to be an even better prophet. It's going to be an even better covenant. I'm sorry. So, again, many different uh, verses point us to the beginning of the new covenant. And the new covenant began with the blood of Jesus Christ. It began, began with the shedding of blood of Jesus Christ. So, at Jesus' death, the new covenant began. And there's many different passages that we can look at and go through and study that will point us to this new covenant beginning. Uh, but we won't do that for this particular study. Uh, that'll be one of definitely in depth. But nonetheless, the we talked about how the covenants all have a promise, a condition, and they have a sign. So the, the promise for this uh, new covenant for grace and truth is finally what we all been hoping for and wanting, and that's eternal life. Eternal life to all who believe is the promise given in John 3, 16. And it says that condition 
for that particular promise is faith. That can be read about in Romans 3, verses 21 through 28. And the sign of that faith is baptism. Colossians chapter 2, verses 11 through 12. And the thing that we do of commemoration is the Lord's Supper, which can be read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 25, Luke 22, verse 20, and Mark 14, verse 24. Upon the taking of the Lord's Supper, when you read those passages, it talks about this, that all who, who partake of this proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. That we proclaim the Lord's death. We believe in his death. We also believe in his resurrection as well. But we believe that he will come again. And we believe that when he does come again, that those who have faith and believe in them, those who are in Christ, will receive the gift of eternal life, eternal salvation. So, Hoping I can better break this down for the sake of this, I guess we can call it an introductory study, that there is a huge difference in the covenants and there's a huge difference in who those covenants apply to. That's most of what I wanted to tackle for today. One of the easiest things I can think of looking at or one of the most clearest things I can think of looking at of how to show a division in covenants is looking at what God says about food. So the question may also be asked too is that for Christians today, what foods are we allowed to eat? Well, I'm going to show you something in scripture. God is giving multiple different uh, food uh, instructions and regulations through multiple different time periods. He gave different uh, food instructions and, prohibi and prohibitions during different covenants that apply to different people. So for a typical example, think about Adam. Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. God told them you can eat from every tree in the garden except for the one of the knowledge of good and evil. That was their commandment. That was between them and God. That was for their covenant. God told Noah that everything that moves shall be food for you. In Genesis 9, 3, God told Noah, every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. That's what he told Noah. You come over to the law of Moses <clears throat> Excuse me. Come up to the law of Moses and you get on down around uh, Leviticus chapter 11 and God told them many different things in that entire chapter of things that they could and couldn't eat. Uh, and that was given to Israel. You read Leviticus and you read the beginning of Leviticus and Deuteronomy and it tells you that this law was given to Israel, that God gave the Mosaic law to give to the nation of Israel. It applied to the Jews. It didn't apply to the Gentiles. Gentiles are simply those who are not Jews. Everybody that's not a Jew is a Gentile. So the law of Moses applied specifically to the nation of Israel, to the Jews, to those whom Moses had given the Ten Commandment covenant to, given that from God. So during that time period, there are many different restrictions on food. We get to fast forward quite a bit, get to the law of grace and truth. And in many different instances, it speaks about food. Uh, notably in 1 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5, if you go there, all food can be eaten as long as it's given thanks for and is not, and it hasn't been sacrificed to idols. So all food is, the, is in the New Testament under the New Covenant was commanded as being clean. And you can read about that in Mark chapter 7, verses 14 through 19, where, if I'm not mistaken, the Pharisees had, uh, confronted Jesus. And of course, they want to try to catch him in a lie. They want to try to catch him slipping up. They wanted to ask Jesus questions, not to really receive answers and receive truth. They were trying to catch him up in whatever he was saying. Like, let's test him and see if he's really who he says he is. Not knowing that Jesus is the life. He's the truth. He has all the answers. He has all the knowledge and all the wisdom. And he had the power to make commandments. But furthermore, they were... Uh, coming to Jesus and talking to Jesus about defiling the body. And they were uh, questioning Jesus and his disciples about why they weren't uh, following the tradition, the manly tradition, the human tradition of washing their hands before they eat. And Jesus told them, as he rebuked them and said, hey, why do you disobey me and not follow the commandments of God? Why do you not follow the commandments of God and not helping out your mother and your father? But what you say is that what you would give to your mother and father, you've already given to God. So what Jesus was saying was, why is it that instead of you helping your parents as the law had commanded, you will say, well, I already have given that and devoted it to the Lord. So I can't I can't help you because I've, I've, I'm, I've done something for the Lord. But what you would know is that 
by the love that God will want us to have for him, uh, if we love the Lord, we will also love our neighbors. We also love our enemies. So that love for the Lord should also encourage us to help others who are in need, especially our parents, especially those of our household, especially of our relatives, especially the house of believers. And them, the Pharisees, they tried to twist that around. And they said, hey, I would do for my parents what, I, what I've already devoted to the Lord. I, I don't have anything else to give. That's all I got to give. Now, people use that excuse all the time. that You know, hey, if I already put something to the side, I can't do anything for you. When truth to the matter is, they can take away some of that that they put to the side and use that and also help if they wanted to. But Jesus told them that it is not what goes into the body or that defiles a person, but it was, it's what comes out of the body that defiles a person. Things that come from the heart, those are the things that makes a person unclean. And we may just do a separate Bible study about that, talking about traditions and commandments. So maybe that's what's going to follow this one, is that Jesus told them it's not what goes into the body that makes a person unclean or makes a person filthy. It's not the food that you eat that makes you dirty or makes you unclean or makes you unrighteous. It's what comes from your heart. It's what you do from your heart, your actions, your sin, your thoughts, your motives, your intentions. It's your behavior. The things that you do, those are the things that make you unclean. And Jesus told them that in Mark 7, verses 14 through 19. So we look back real quick in these different covenants. God told Adam, you can eat whatever you want to from any of these trees. It's not from a tree of good and evil. He told Noah, everything that moves, Noah, shall be food for you. Genesis 9, 3. The law of Moses, many different food restrictions found in the book of Leviticus chapter 11. Grace and truth, eat whatever you want. Give thanks for it and just make sure that just this is not food to sacrifice to idols. Don't eat this food and say sacrifice unto an idol to a false god, but just give God thanks. That's why we say blessings or we say grace before we eat our food because we're saying, Lord, I don't know where this came from. I don't know who prepared it necessarily, but I'm giving you thanks for it. And I'm receiving this gift of food out of thanksgiving and I'm thanking you for this food. So with that being said, as the Bible says, and read about it in 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, that by giving thanks for that food, that food is therefore blessed. And it can be received. So I say all that to say this. For Christians, for those who are believers of, of the Lord, for those who follow Christ, we find our marching orders in the new covenant, the law of grace and truth. We find our instruction in the law of grace and truth. We find the commandments that we are to follow in grace and truth. And, and even more so, I want to close out with a scripture in Galatians 3, verses 3 through 26, the, the transfer, the progress and the process from the law of Moses to the law of Christ uh, kind of be finalized here. So it says that, but the scripture has shut up everyone under sin so that the promise by faith in Jesus Christ might be given to those who believe. But before faith came, we were kept in custody under the law, being shut up to the faith which was later to be revealed. Therefore, the law has become our tutor to lead us to Christ so that we may be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor for you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. And for women who believe, you're daughters of God in Christ Jesus. So it gives us that finalization there. And again, what God commands and demands of us of believers today is going to be found in the new covenant. That's what applies to us. The old covenant, we can use that to learn more about God's character, God's integrity, and learn more about who God is. Who God is. We learn more about God from the old covenant, from the old law, predominantly from the Old Testament in general because of how God interacted and interfaced with man. That God interfaced with man, Moses, he was one who... When you think about it, he, you know, we regard other people as being, you know, more high, more higher. We regard, we regard the Apostle Paul as being, you know, a very prominent individual. We regard uh, uh, King David as being a very prominent guy. But Moses, Moses was, you think about who else was able to interface directly with God the way Moses was. The God was able to go one for one with Moses and give him instruction and speak directly to him and give him this inspired word that he wrote and that he put down. Uh, so another, we got to start 
you know, giving more regards and respect to Moses and, and his relationship with the Lord and just who he was just in our historical history um, of the body of Christ. But nonetheless, again, you learn more about God's nature oftentimes from the Old Testament because you see how God dealt with people. So we learn how God dealt with people, his general feelings, his general thoughts. We learn about his character, his nature in the Old Testament. True. But our marching orders for believers, our promise, our conditions are found in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, in the law of grace and truth. So we must be careful to study to show ourselves approved so we can rightfully divide this word of truth. I know it's probably seemed like a lot. I feel like I, it was a lot of material and I know it's all covered through many different passages. It's my intention to try to put it in the, in the description below so you can follow back up. Um, but I wanted to just do an introductory passage and just give us a reminder and give us just a general instruction uh, for those who maybe may be new in the Lord, new in Christ, or those who just need a reminder that, again, our marching orders, our covenant that God made with us for eternal life, that covenant is found through Jesus Christ. So everything after Jesus is where we, we come into play and what's all coming into effect. The law was just a tutor. The law of Moses was just a tutor. The law of Moses' whole purpose was really to make make man uh, knowledgeable of their sin. Before that, man didn't know about wrongdoing. Man didn't know what sin was without the law. Without God giving restrictions, man didn't know what wrong was. What is disobeying God like? Unless God say specifically, don't do this one thing. Like God told Adam, uh, what tree to eat from and what tree not to. And he had one commandment, one commandment to do. He broke it. Now, I'm not bashing him because that's what man do. We, we we get instructions and we do whatever we want to do and we disobey. But what I'm saying is that God gave that instruction to Adam. Adam broke that instruction. God gave instructions to the people of Israel, to the nation of Israel. And many times, many times over, they were disobeyed his commands. Now, in the law of grace and truth, with that being said, sin has increased because the knowledge of sin has increased. The knowledge of sin has grown. Sin has increased. But the Bible says in the book of Romans that where sin increased, grace also increased. Unmerited favor also increased. So now, uh, due to God's grace for us, he gives us a more allowance for sin. Not saying he's tolerant of it, but God gives us forgiveness for our sins because of his son's sacrifice on the cross, Jesus Christ. Because of his death and resurrection, because of his blood, we have an opportunity to receive forgiveness of sin for all those who confess and believe. And when the Bible says we confess our sins to the Lord, that he is faithful to forgive us of all unrighteousness. And again, just remembering that uh, we look to the Lord for our salvation. We look to Jesus for our salvation. He is the author and finisher of our faith. Let us all continue to look towards him. I'm asking and pray that you will just stay prayed up, stay in the word, in season and out. Just continue to stay focused, persevere, continue to push forward. I know times may get rough, they may get difficult, but continue to persevere, endure, knowing that for every temptation that there is a way of escape, that God allows you to endure during that temptation because he will allow you to exit that, that situation, those circumstances. All these challenges and all these hardships are all temporary. All suffering is temporary. It's not permanent. So again, let us all just endure, stay prayed up, keep the faith, remain hopeful, and endure to death. Again, as always, I thank you for your time. God bless you.